I'd like to take this opportunity to quickly introduce our institute. Our institute, in short, J-I-S-I-A-S-R, is a postgraduate research institute under the leadership of Padma Shri Professor Ajay Kumar Ray. We aim to contribute interdisciplinary translational research, creativity, and entrepreneurship towards the transformation and welfare to, of our society. We have three centers here, Center for Data Science, Center for Health Science and Technology, Center for Interdisciplinary Science. We have five important aspects which make our institute unique in Eastern Zone. Number one, we have very well equipped lab with fully functional Illumina MySec next generation sequencer. Number two, we have internationally experienced faculty pool with active national and international collaboration. Number three, we have high budget research grants from DBT Welcome Trust, DBT Ramalinga Shami Fellowship, ICMR, DST, et cetera. Number four, we are continuously publishing our research in high impact journals. Number five, and the most important aspect is our course structure, which is well designed by experienced professors, keeping an eye to job prospect, but without compromising the basic conceptual parts of the syllabus. Center for Health Science and Technology offers two-year MSc in Medical Biotechnology and Bioinformatics and one-year advanced diploma in Bioinformatics. All the eligibility criteria are shown here. We are also looking for PhD students for both integrated and regular PhD options in the related fields. Detailed information may be found from our website, www.jisiasr.org. Our admission is going on now. Interested candidates may apply online for any admission related credit please feel free to call us at 892124830 or 8583916473 you can find the phone numbers on screen or you can drop us an email at biosimp at that it j i s i a s r dot o r g i repeat b i o s y m p at that it j i s i a s r dot o r g or visit our website or facebook page next month we are organizing annual distinguished lecture series 2021 please keep an eye on our website and facebook page for detailed information and now it is time to talk about science. May I request Dr. Shuja Chattopadhyay to introduce our today's speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Devavani. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's time for us to introduce our today's speaker for webinar series 4, 2021, Dr. Anundo Bondopadhyay, the Deputy Director Polio, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USA. Uh, now, normally to introduce a distinguished speaker like him, I would say it's a great privilege, it's an honor to have him here. Undoubtedly it is, but for me now, it's way more than what could be expressed in such a formal way. My feeling is uh, it's surreal. Anandu is my childhood friend, used to play a lot of cricket together. I'm extremely thrilled, super excited to have him as our speaker today. One more great news to share with you. Very recently, he has kindly agreed our invitation of honorary adjunct professorship in our Center for Health Science and Technology. Thanks so much, Anandu, for accepting this invitation and for supporting uh, the journey of this newborn institute. Anandu is a medical epidemiologist with uh, experience in global health infectious disease. He grew up in Kolkata and completed his uh, medical graduation from Calcutta National Medical College and Hospital in 2005 with a gold medal and several honor certificates. He received his master's, uh, a master of public health, MP. 
three in global health from Harvard School of Public Health in 2010 in diverse cities and has contributed to initiatives across the globe. Based out of Seattle, United States, Anando in his current role at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation coordinates global research to facilitate polio eradication. His work on clinical development of novel vaccines and vaccination schedules have been impactful in global policy formulation and have been published in leading peer reviewed journals. Anundu is associated with advanced degree programs in public health and vaccinology in several globally renowned teaching venues as a guest faculty. Now, without any further delay, let's welcome Dr. Anundu Bandabhatai. The title of his talk today Vaccine Development for Public Health Emergencies of International Concern. Over to you, Anundu. Thank you so much. And you, you nicely picked the, the right word. It is surreal to, to be with you here in, in this platform, uh, quite a journey together, um, and also a, a, a real privilege uh, to speak with you all uh, and to speak for uh, Kolkata, you know, uh, an organization that is based out of Kolkata, and also, also uh, you know, to the to audience in India at large. Uh, it's always an honor to do so. So in the short time that we have today, I'll speak about uh, a topic that is of, of huge current relevance, uh, developing vaccines for public health emergencies of international concern. What I'll do is I'll essentially ensure the three basic concepts around this topical issue uh, is clear to all of you. So I'll start off with uh, discussing basic principles of vaccine and vaccination. I'll then talk about public health emergencies of international concern. What do they mean? What's the relevance uh, in today's world? And then finally, I'll, I'll discuss accelerated vaccine development to respond to public health emergencies of international concern. And to do that, I'll pick one case study or essentially one vaccine uh, to go for the, you know, the details of how do you develop I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, just to note that the, the, the topic today goes over and beyond what I do in my day to day work life, uh, which is currently cen centered around eradication of polio. Uh, so I, you know, I would uh, essentially highlight that whatever I say today uh, and discuss are essentially my own uh, opinion and views and doesn't necessarily represent. Uh, the views of my employer, the Gates Foundation, or uh, my professional affiliations. So with that, let's launch into today's discussion. To start off, let's ensure we all understand what do we mean by the word vaccine. So a very basic definition of vaccine uh, would essentially involve, uh, you know, describing vaccine as a product that essentially stimulates immune response uh, in, a, in, a, in an individual, but it doesn't essentially induce the, the, the corresponding disease in the individual. And in turn, by generating immune response, a vaccine would, would essentially protect the individual, in certain cases, the community against the risk of that disease. Vaccines can be administered in many different ways. We are, we are typically used to seeing vaccines being administered uh, through injections or oral route, but uh, you know, these days vaccines can be also administered through the nasal uh, route and, and there are other routes of administration as well. So quite a broad overall uh, topic you know, when, we, when we think about vaccine. You know, essentially the word vaccine evolved uh, from the Latin word vaccinus, uh, which essentially goes back to 1796, uh, when Edward Jenner uh, essentially inoculated an individual suffering from, from smallpox with the pus that, that he collected uh, from a milkmaid 
who was suffering from cowpox. Uh, so essentially that's how the word really evolved. And this example of, of what Edward Jenner did uh, is an ex example of what we call heterotypic immunity, where you are generating immunity uh, by introducing a different organism, which is linked biologically, but not exactly the same, but it still induces immunity that is good enough uh, to essentially protect uh, for the disease that the individual is at risk with. So with that very basic understanding of what vaccines are, we, we really want to ensure we understand the impact of vaccines. And you know, essentially, one can spend a whole lecture on that. But just to sum it up in one slide or in two bullets, vaccines are by far the most cost-effective investments uh, that modern science has produced. Essentially, if there is anything safer and more effective uh, than vaccine and more cost effective than vaccine, it's probably, uh, you know, safe drinking water. Other than that, uh, you know, this is one tool that is, uh, that outweighs essentially everything else in terms of its cost effectiveness. Uh, given the number of deaths, it, it, it prevents or it can prevent. However, you know, although there is that potential impact of vaccines, uh, we still see uh, kids, children, and, and people dying of vaccine preventable diseases. And you can see the staggering number in here, roughly every 20 second, we are possibly losing a child from vaccine preventable diseases. So there is uh, you know, a huge promise and impact, a well-known impact from vaccines, but still there is scope in the real world uh, to administer vaccines in a way that, that translates into saving more lives than what we are doing today. A very brief kind of one-on-one -on, -one on, on immunology around vaccines. Again, we, don't, we are not getting into details, but these basic concepts are important to understand. So vaccines, so when it comes to immunity, uh, you know, we, we essentially have two broad types of, of immunity. One is, the, is what we call the first line of defense or the innate or non-specific immunity that we are all born with unless there is an inherent uh, immunocompromised condition. And then there is the whole spectrum of adaptive immunity or specific immunity this is the immunity that we that our body, our system essentially gets trained with as we get exposed to different antigens, be it through natural exposure or through vaccines itself. And within the, the adaptive immunity spectrum, broadly we can we can divide it up into cell mediated immunity, uh, which essentially acts through T cell activation and primarily targets uh, virus or organism infected cells. On the other hand, we also have humoral immunity, which is primarily mediated by antibodies. And, and this particular type of immunity primarily targets the, the non-infected cells of the body. Again, overall a vaccine can essentially modulate both types of adaptive immunity, primarily the most of the vaccines that we have would work through humoral immunity of our, our human body. So with that, uh, another basic uh, concept around vaccine performance, you know, with COVID these days, you, you hear these terms all the time uh, in newspapers elsewhere, I would like to ensure all of those who are participating in this call today uh, are absolutely clear about what do we mean uh, by immunogenicity, efficacy, and effectiveness of a vaccine. Essentially, immunogenicity uh, is a lab marker. So, so we, we typically measure antibody responses uh, you know, from serological samples of a particular individual and then assess the, the, the level of the antibodies relative to pre-vaccination status. And that's how you determine 
the immunogenicity of a vaccine. Efficacy, on the other hand, which is probably the most important uh, term uh, these days related uh, to the pandemic, it essentially depicts the ability of a vaccine to provide protection against the disease in concern. And efficacy typically of a vaccine is measured by clinical trials. So you need randomized controlled clinical trials, ideally, uh, to measure the efficacy of a vaccine. And finally, effectiveness. Uh, you know, don't confuse effectiveness with efficacy of the vaccine. Effectiveness essentially is more of a public health term where we are assessing the real world impact of a vaccine at a population level, uh, again, uh, to protect against the risk of the concerned disease. So beyond laboratories, beyond the individual uh, protection against disease, effectiveness essentially ass assesses you know, what happens if a vaccine is administered at a mass scale? What does it do to communities uh, in terms of its protection against disease? Because you know, when, you, when you go out of laboratories, when you go out of clinical trials, that is you know, beyond immunogenicity, beyond efficacy, a lot of other factors also play in. How do you manage your cold chain? What's the baseline health status? of the community, et cetera, et cetera. And that sometimes contributes to the overall effectiveness of the, uh, of the vaccine. So that's the basic concept. And as I said, hopefully we'll not get confused uh, with these terms around vaccines. And just to make it even clearer, I just put together this basic equation uh, around uh, vaccine efficacy evaluation. It's pretty simple. So you basically need to understand the attack rate of a particular disease in unimmunized population. And then you compare it with the attack rate of the disease in immunized population. Again, because it's efficacy, as we learned in the previous slide, it's measured in a clinical trial setting. So just to give you another, you know, just to expand the exp example, uh, if you take, for example, a COVID vaccine trial, uh, if there are 100 subjects uh, who are vaccinated and out of those 100, maybe four develop uh, the COVID disease uh, in contrast to the control group where out of the 100, maybe 20 uh, developed COVID-19, the overall vaccine efficacy against COVID-19, against the disease of interest uh, would be 80% or so. That's how these numbers pop up that we see these days uh, in the newspapers and elsewhere. So moving now on to the, the space of, vac of, of the public health emergencies of international concern and also emerging diseases. I think before we get into the definition, uh, we need to understand we are in a changing world uh, where you know, communication uh, is like never before. Every disease is essentially a plane ride away. Every infectious disease that is uh, in our you know, super connected world. And beyond that, there is also urbanization happening at a rapid scale in, in different parts of the world. Population movement related to the connectivity is also on the rise. And at the same time, we still have very weak health systems weak detection mechanisms and surveillance systems in parts of the world. And then, of course, transborder and international um, and international all, you know, both ways uh, trades happen, you know, to animals and food, etc. So all of these factors make us more vulnerable than ever uh, to emerging diseases for that essentially transition of zoonotic diseases or diseases restricted typically to animals to make that move over into the human population. So that, that's something we'll have to keep in the back of our mind. And with that, let's understand the definition of public health emergencies of international concern. 
So essentially it is defined by WHO as an extraordinary event, which is determined to constitute a public health risk to states. Uh, and you know, this is very important. You know, the, the fact that it's, it's, it's putting at risk multiple countries at a time through the potential of international spread of the disease and, and you know, eventually would need a potential coordinated response, a global response. So what is really important to understand in here, first of all is we are defining public health emergencies of international concern as an event. So it may or may not always be diseases. You know, so far we have uh, you know, ca classified, categorized, public health emergencies of international concerns as diseases, you know, or, or among diseases. But please note, it could be a, an event that is putting the public health uh, at risk. You know, in, in Hollywood drama, it could be an alien invasion, but we, we haven't quite seen that as yet. But, but just to put that into context, that the scope is much bigger uh, than just diseases. And what is really important to understand when we talk about extraordinary uh, is this suddenness, the seriousness and the unusualness uh, of the new disease or the new pattern of an existing disease. And then finally, you know, all that you will have to remember is this global nature of the risk. Uh, so you know, this fact that it is affecting across the borders and also the response that we need to mount has to be globally coordinated to stop it. And I keep telling people that unlike us, you know, who are restricted by borders and caste and creed and religion and whatnot, viruses are more noble. You know, they, they do not care about borders. They transcend borders in no time. Uh, and and it, it also affects you know, people from all strata of the society. So, so that inherent risk with some organisms are still there where everybody, every nation could be vulnerable. And that's what makes public health emergencies of international concern so important, so relevant. Just a few examples you know, of, of, the, of the, the kind of uh, you know, categorizations that WHO uh, and the international health regulations uh, have already made around public health emergencies of international concern. So starting from 2009 of the classification of the, of the H1N1 uh, pandemic to polio uh, being classified as a public health emergency in 2014 and several episodes of Ebola over time, Zika, and then now to the COVID pandemic that is affecting all of us in some way or the other. And then there are some diseases which are by default public health emergency of international concern. Smallpox is one because it's the only human disease that has been eradicated. And then polio is another one where, where you know, it's very close to eradication. You know, essentially it has reached the status of regional elimination in most places, except for a few countries. So there are a couple of uh, kind of you know, usual suspect uh, when it comes to public health emergencies of international concern. Before I get into how do we accelerate vaccine, vaccine development, this is a chart for you all uh, to depict what vaccine development essentially takes. I don't expect you to go through all the lines in here, but it is just a, a message that vaccine development is a long drawn uh, and, and very laborious process. It starts from early stage cross-cutting activities where you sense a disease is happening through surveillance systems, sequencing results, you understand the pattern of the organism, then you get into the preclinical phase where you are trying to develop assays and, and you know, select proteins and antigens to potentially uh, develop the vaccine. And then you get into you know, the clinical phase, which typically is the longest phase. And it goes through phase one, clinical trial and typically in higher age group individuals, and then to phase two and phase three clinical trials, successively in, in different age groups, getting into more vulnerable populations in that, with the advancement of the different phases of the clinical trials. And then finally, you, you do your post licensure, 
post pre-qualification monitoring, uh, once you have developed the data uh, for licensure and for pre-qualification. So it's a, it's a prolonged process. And typically it would take, you know, even in the past decade, you know, anywhere around five to 15 years or sometimes longer, uh, depending on the type of antigen type of disease we are talking about. But if you put global health into context, if you put the current situation of public health emergencies uh, into con context, we cannot wait for that long. We need vaccines of such potential pandemics right away. But how do we balance that out? You know, how do we prepare for such epidemics, develop vaccines super quick, uh, and then at the same time ensure they're safe and effective? So that's the whole point of vaccine development uh, for public health emergencies. And this one slide, which is courtesy one of my colleagues from, from one of the courses that I teach, this slide really very nicely summarizes the evolution over time when it comes to the focus of vaccine development, the dependencies of vaccine development. So from the, the 1900s and even earlier where it was primarily based out of an animal model and also basic understanding of immunology, it moved into the, into the 1950s and 1960s where the for, you know, when the first polio vaccine, for example, was developed, it moved more into virology space and more into the space of cell culture based development of vaccines. And that revolutionized uh, the vaccine space, to be honest. And, and in the in next 30 to 40 years, we saw a, a whole array of new vaccines coming into uh, the public health use space. And then again, there was a major change, uh, you know, I would say in the past 10 ish years where the molecular techniques and then some of the things that you all are so, uh, you know, great experts of and will be experts and leaders about the, the whole space around molecular development and genomics, uh, you know, and the understanding of application of gene based uh, delivery mechanisms understanding of functional and structural biology, you know, has completely revolutionized the vaccine space of late. And, and that's what you're seeing getting reflected uh, in the fight against COVID pandemic as well. And we anticipate as we move into the future uh, in the next 10, 20 years, this space will essentially explode uh, and, and, you know, essentially translate into saving more lives and, and, and doing that in a much quicker uh, and precise way. And that's exactly what this slide summarizes. So we need both precision in terms of the focus against the, the, the specific antigen or the specific disease agent that the vaccine needs to fight against, but we need to also come up with it with adequate speed. And you, you'll, you'll see in here the range of different genetic engineering mechanisms, molecular techniques uh, that we are applying now from, as I said, uh, you know, the cell-based or structural uh, vaccine design-based applications uh, to doing engineering with proteins and self-assembly of nanoparticles to moving into recombinant uh, nucleic acid technologies. It's, it's a vast spectrum uh, of, of development that is happening as we speak. And what has happened with this is this, you know, uh, this ability of the vaccine developers to get ready for the next potential that, you know, proverbial disease X without having to culture, without having to develop, isolate, uh, you know, that particular virus uh, in the laboratory. So, you know, it really has gone through a major, major change in the, in the, in the few, in the past few, uh, you know, recent years. And of course, one of the examples is the mRNA technology for vaccine development, potentially a game changer. Uh, and you know, you know, in this slide, we have essentially drawn a metaphor of using mRNA technology, uh, you know, to the use of software, essentially, where you have, you know, your storage capabilities, and then you develop the quote software unquote, and then you apply it uh, to different 
uh, use case in, in day-to-day life. And that's exactly how uh, the mRNA technique essentially work, where the mRNA molecule essentially has signatures of the protein that it, it would induce uh, in the body. And the body would then uh, you know, mount an immune, re- immune response against that particular uh, protein of relevance. In, in, you know, in, the, in the example of COVID is the spike protein. It could be different things in, you know, in terms of different targets. So overall, uh, you know, if you see at the COVID vaccine space based out of the modern vaccine technology, it has you know, a range of vaccines. And you know, this is not an exhaustive list. This is only the, the, the molecules that are under clinical development, courtesy uh, you know, the, the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, or CEPI, uh, who are tracking you know, these developments. But you can, you can see how quickly molecules have been developed. And, and please note, these are not all modern techniques. And there are also traditional vaccine development that is happening uh, through inactivated or attenuated strains of COVID as well. And in fact, you know, in India, one uh, of the vaccines is you know, by that mechanism and more coming in. So it's a mix uh, you know, when it comes to different types of technologies. Uh, but with a heavy lift uh, from the modern technology, the more modular adaptive uh, development technologies that we have developed of late. So, you know, there is no time to get into each step of vaccine development, you know, for public health emergencies, but I'll, I'll cite one example building on the regulatory process. So, you know, developing vaccine from, from modular techniques from adaptive platforms, from nucleotides and and vectors is is one thing. But we also need to think about how do we introduce that vaccine? You know, just the pre-qualification licensure uh, process of of a vaccine introduction can take months and sometimes more. So, So this is another new concept that has been added, which is the emergency use listing of of public health tools. So EUL, something that WHO has come up with. And what it does is is enables early introduction of public health tools, vaccines and diagnostics included so that you can use that tool while the tool is still under development because you have to strike a risk benefit balance. When you see a a disease like COVID rapidly spreading, causing death and devastation, you you really need not wait till the last box is checked when it comes to vaccine development. You can be informed about a time point in, in the development process where you have adequate data to give directions uh, to use the vaccine and save lives. And then you continuously generate more data to fine tune the, the use case of the vaccine. So this whole idea of a, of a regulatory pathway to enable vaccines or diagnostic tools uh, under a public health emergency of international concern is critically important. Uh, and uh, let's see, what do we know about this so far? So this is a fun poll for all of you. If I ask you, what is the, the, the first vaccine that was ever listed under emergency use listing process of WHO, what would your answer be? You know, the options are in front of you, you know, from the Pfizer, BioNTech uh, COVID vaccine to the Moderna COVID vaccine or the novel oral polio vaccine. AstraZeneca, COVID, or none of the above. Maybe you can you can write your your responses in the chat box, and, and we can have a quick look later. But but w- without building much of a suspense, you know, unlike perhaps what most of you think, it is not the COVID vaccines which received the first ever EUL by WHO. It was actually the novel oral polio vaccine type two that received this designation in November 2020. So it's pretty recent. And COVID vaccines soon followed. So by December 2020, we had COVID vaccines, you know, starting to get EUL 
uh, listing. So what is novel OPV? I'll just give you an example, uh, just to put things into context as to you know, what's a real life example of, of a vaccine development uh, for public health emergency. So novel OPV is essentially a modification of the existing OPV or oral polio vaccine that you're all used to seeing being administered in the field. Essentially, the, the current uh, or the, or the you know, OPV that you all have seen being used, uh, a serotype of that OPV has been genetically modified in specific uh, you know, areas of the genome. So we have essentially replaced specific nucleotides through you know, essentially cutting edge uh, you know, functional molecular biology. Uh, and, and by that, what we have done is, is to make the vaccine more genetically stable. And this was desperately needed. This was a public health need because we were observing that in rare circumstances, the vaccine virus was reverting into vaccine derived polio viruses in specific settings of low immunization coverage, uh, you know, so particularly in settings uh, in, in a few African countries and elsewhere. So this was a public health need. The scientific community came together, you know, did the molecular work to develop a vaccine that doesn't have the same risk of losing the attenuations uh, in the vaccine molecule. And we got into clinical development and over a period of roughly three years, we went from phase one to multiple phase twos and, and the data generated from these studies enabled the EUL listing of the vaccine and multiple innovative steps were incorporated uh, in the process of development of this vaccine. You know, these photos gives you a glimpse of how a custom built uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, you know, setting was 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 built in in an area in Belgium, where the initial few subjects, the the study subjects, stayed back uh, for 30 days as the vaccine was first evaluated. So it was more of a of a big boss or or that kind of a of a house setting that we had, where folks were living in together, so that you know the vaccines are not you know, immediately going outside of this well-contained setting. Uh, and so that we had a chance to rapidly evaluate the, the nature, the characteristics of the vaccine, whether it undergoes you know, similar kind of reversions or not. And an absolutely you know, cutting edge next gen sequencing methods were applied uh, into the, the samples so that we have quick results so that the subjects can be then let go of the, of, the, of the facility and then be moved into larger clinical trials. And I'm not getting into details, but all these trials are now published in the Lancet over the past one, one and a half years. And all of this data contributed not only for this vaccine to get the first UL listing to pave the way potentially for the COVID vaccines, as I mentioned, but also most importantly, to get to the child, uh, to, to be administered uh, under the EUL requirements in the field uh, was the greatest achievement. Because again, as you would recall, polio is still a public health emergency of international concern, much like the pandemic uh, that is also categorized in a similar way. So I've come to the end of today's uh, you know, discussion. Uh, and a quick run through of this overall concept. Uh, but what I would like to, to ensure you all take home as maybe one single message uh, is this issue that vaccines, you know, no matter how effective they are, you know, no matter how good of a technology that you have applied to develop a vaccine from you know, the, the, the old school live or live attenuated or inactivated vaccines to the new age mRNA vaccines, you know, it really doesn't matter how effective the vaccine is if the vaccine stays like this. It, if, it is st if it stays in within the vaccine vials, it is 0% effective. What really makes the real world difference in terms of impact of vaccines 
is vaccination. So if you ask me, you know, it is really vaccination that saves lives. Vaccines may or may not, if it is not used uh, in a way that it is, it is needed to be. So, you know, I would like to conclude by giving my salute to these uh, real world champions, you know, these are all glimpses from India. When I used to work in India as a surveillance medical officer, uh, you know, working to, to eliminate polio, these are the real world champions. Look at them, you know, they're, they're vaccinating kids from house to house, you know, while they're still in knee deep water. Uh, you know, so I, I keep saying if there's ever a global health Olympics, maybe these vaccinators would bring back some medals, including this 70 year old vaccinator who, are swim, who is swimming across a flooded area in Bihar, but still keeping the vaccine career afloat. So, so this is the real world of vaccines and vaccination. So, you know, no matter how brilliant of scientists and public health leaders you all become, uh, you know, please keep this real world connect with you and please ensure that the vaccines that are developed uh, are applicable, adaptable to the situation uh, where there is the acute need to save lives. So overall, uh, you know, I only like to reiterate that vaccines, you know, continue with, to be the most impactful uh, public health tool that we ever had. Uh, you know, we have new insights now with, with learnings around immunology, uh, the options of, of genetic sequencing, microbiology, and, and so on to essentially respond to public health emergencies much more effectively, both through diagnostics, which we didn't discuss today, and through vaccines and health interventions. Uh, and finally, it all depends on the final acceptance in the community, the logistics planning, uh, of distribution of the vaccine uh, and then how the vaccine is working in the field. And that's what really makes the real world difference. So with that, I'll thank again the, the, the faculty committee and the, and the overall leadership of the university for, for this opportunity to speak with you. And I'll hand it over to Shujoy and the team uh, for any comments, over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it needs a, I would say it needs a rare talent to dive so deep in scientific discussion uh, with the help of minimized use of jargons. Uh, so insightful yet, uh, uh, I would say so lucid. So uh, you can, yeah, you can expect uh, the questions coming uh, uh, one after another slowly. So uh, before we to the question, uh, this kind of this list of questions from the attendees today. So just uh, maybe a bit controversial question. I mean, it's, it's my uh, uh, curiosity if you can shed any light on this. So uh, I'm reading the provincial takers uh, from the ones uh, developed by Siram Institute in India are facing hurdles uh, in, in uh, entering European countries. So, I mean, how actually you, you see uh, this kind of uh, developing the same vaccine in different uh, places over the world uh, could make such a difference and why this kind of uh, ban? I mean, they are vaccinated, but, ba but banned some kind of uh, ironical situation we are in. So anything you want to say? Yeah, thanks for, for raising that. So vaccine equity is a big issue. And also, as I said, to start with, you know, the virus doesn't differentiate, uh, you, know, you know, based on nationality, based on anything else, you know, all that matters, you know, if you're immune or not. Uh, so we also have to do a better job of, of more uniformity around acceptance uh, of different vaccines. And that's why this, this regulatory pathway that I mentioned of emergency use listing is so important. You know, it gives that global platform for a vaccine uh, to be evaluated by international uh, and subject matter experts. Uh, and then, you know, based on that evaluation, uh, the WHO pre-qualification team would designate a vaccine to be to be listed under EUL. So, 
you know, you know, these are still early days. So we still see some discord with a few vaccines, you know, nationally approved for use, but those are yet not uh, evaluated fully uh, at a platform that would, you know, enable UL. And then there would be countries that would, you know, strictly rely on that international or global, uh, you know, acceptance uh, than a country-based evaluation to allow uh, for travels to happen. So, so this is, I would say, still work in progress. But you know, I think we have already made some some significant progress. You know, with uh, the EUL listing of so many vaccines in a short span of time, that does open up or addresses uh, this concern that you have. But but still, it's it's you know, it's not done yet, and we need to come together more as a global community. Uh, to develop, you know, such uniform uh, platforms that that would, you know, inform decision making in a way uh, where it is more accepted across uh, the world compared to a country by country uh, acceptance. But it's a it's a complex <laughs> space. You know, regulatory approvals, you know, come with their you know own uh, challenges really. So the makers, I mean, uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, so Oxford and AstraZeneca, so, they, so the makers normally, they do not have any standardized protocol for quality control thing. I mean, wherever they are, uh, they're not allowing it to get developed. Well, absolutely they do. So there are standardized, you know, protocols, you know, uh, markers of quality, of vaccine development that applies to all. So that is that is very basic. What we are discussing here, you know, today here is, is this trigger, you know, when you, you know, think you, the vaccine is ready to be applied uh, in the population, balancing that risk benefit. So, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, we would, you know, wait till every study is done, uh, you know, every data is analyzed in a particular way. Uh, and then you go through the pre-qualification process and then you introduce the vaccine. But in the context of a pandemic, on one hand, we are learning every day the nature of the disease, the nature of the virus, the pattern of the spread, the impact it is having you know, on human lives. And on the other hand, you, you, know, you have potentials uh, with early molecules and in some, some cases, you know, pretty late uh, clinical uh, development has happened with, with certain vaccines, you have that potential to, to take a call based out of your scientific understanding with the regulatory support, be it in the country or in the, at the global level, to introduce the vaccine still under some amount of monitoring. And this space is new. You know, this, this requires a lot of customized uh, you know, assessment. Uh, so, so to be clear, there is no difference in general in terms of the basic qualitative aspects that different companies, you know, have to satisfy uh, to, to essentially have a vaccine to be introduced. Where the difference lies, you know, in the, in the current context or in the context of public health emergencies is timing, uh, is, you know, is, is that early introduction based on sufficient scientific data sufficient as you know evaluated by the relevant experts but you still do not wait till you know the very end of the standard classic development process yeah, yeah i, I um, should not take any more advantage i need to go for the questions here uh, so yeah first of all when you took the poll Sri Porna uh, gave the correct answer, polio one, right at that point. That's uh, great. So when I, when I go to Kolkata next time, a, a gift should be due for her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kamachi Sureka thanks you for a great talk. Iftika Rahman asks uh, one question. How would we choose the formulation that is whole inactivated or recombinant of uh, recombinant vaccines concerning a national or international scenario? That's a terrific question, Eftikar. And there are several 
dependencies, there are several factors that contribute to this choice. So one issue is, you know, how quickly you want to develop the vaccine. So if speed uh, typically takes over, then you probably want to develop a vaccine through the recombinant technologies or, or through some of those newer modular uh, technologies because inactivation itself can take time and you know it comes with its own risk of, of you know of a, of a whole process but but at the same time it's not an all or none so in some uh, examples in some for some diseases uh, you know the recombinant vaccines may not really work in terms of immunogenicity and in in some diseases immunogenicity the you know the height of titers, the, the extent of immunogenicity is the driver, uh, you know, and in those cases, inactivated vaccines could be of choice. There are other factors as well. You know, if you take again polio as an example, we both have inactivated and live uh, attenuated vaccines and they're used in different contexts, you know. So inactivated vaccine, for example, doesn't typically interrupt person to person transmission because it doesn't typically replicate uh, in the human body. It induces antibodies, but it doesn't replicate typically itself compared to the live vaccines, which typically replicates. And that's why there is the promise of a population level immunity through transmission of the vaccine itself. So if the national uh, you know, policy driver uh, is that, then you go for you know, a, a direction of a live attenuated vaccine. If it is towards individual protection uh, and maybe you know, with multiple doses, the height of protection may be inactivated vaccines. You know, if, if speed is needed, maybe you know, recombinant, but again, all of this would have nuances. Uh, and you know, it, it is really case to case uh, that you make a choice. And then there is, there is manufacturing uh, capabilities as well. You know, there could be a plant in a particular country which may go to recombinant technology over a period of time, but it might have inactivated uh, vaccine development, uh, you know, technology with them. Uh, so, so that could also, uh, you know, in a way balance out the time gain. So all of these factors are pretty important uh, when you decide, and it's typically not a straightforward uh, decision. Uh, Devapani Ganguly thanks you for the excellent talk and then uh, one question from Kamaksi Sudeka. What is the probability of reversion of virulent phenotype in a vaccine? Is there any other example of such phenomenon uh, besides the polio one? Yeah, Kamakshi, that's a, that's a great point. So the, the probability of reversion to virulence uh, you know, typically applies to live attenuated vaccines. Uh, so, you know, you, you can think about any live attenuated vaccines and the theoretical probability could be there. We have more prominently seen this in the, in the domain of polio vaccines. And again, you know, please note that out of the millions of doses of oral polio vaccine, uh, that are typically administered, you see in the rarest of the rare event, such a reversion. Uh, so it's a very rare event, typically one case in four to six million uh, doses. And also it depends on the context in the community, background immunity, et cetera. But that's the scale, millions of doses for that one uh, reversion uh, to happen. Uh, but yes, so, so that's the rate, first of all, even for polio. Uh, for other diseases, diseases you know, where we have live uh, vaccines, you know, like influenza and others, there is a theoretical probability, but we don't quite see this happen. The, the primary reason uh, is the fact that the genetic uh, you know, reversion uh, you know, doesn't necessarily translate into, a, into a, a clinical condition. So, you know, if you do uh, sequencing work really well, you might pick up uh, some of these uh, reversions, uh, which could theoretically uh, have some virulence properties, 
but you typically don't see that in the clinical practice. In polio, we have seen that, uh, you, know, you know, both in terms of, uh, you know, the genetic sequencing where we have identified nucleic acids and, and specific amino acid sequences, uh, which leads to higher virulence. And then we have correlated that uh, with paralysis cases in rarest of the rare events. Uh, you know, so, so there is that correlation there uh, with polio, which is not quite there uh, you know, in, a, in a routine pra practice. I think the other reason is the mass scale administration uh, of the oral vaccine. And you know, that's how you, you essentially increase uh, your, uh, your you know, N and you, you, you increase your probability to find out, uh, and also surveillance is important. How much you're sequencing, to essentially to understand this phenomenon. Uh, question from Srikonda Chattopadhyay: uh, When a vaccine comes in play, it works against one strain. However, in this present situation, where the virus is undergoing several mutations, how this situation is handled? I mean, do the vaccines work? against other mutated strains too? Yeah, that's a very relevant question. And uh, Shiparna, you know, you know, overall, from what we understand, you know, when you say the vaccine, I'm assuming you're talking about the COVID vaccine here. Uh, you know, yes, you know, from the early evidence that we have, uh, it, it seems like it does act against uh, most of the mutants. You know, some of the mutants are developing and, and we are learning as we speak. Uh, what is, what, you know, essentially is different is the impact, the scale of impact. So if you recall, I talked about immunogenicity, efficacy and effectiveness. Uh, so immunogenicity uh, of, of a few vaccines against COVID is varying when it comes to different mutant strains, but it is not all or none. So far, we haven't seen that a vaccine, uh, you know, that is being used uh, for COVID is quote not acting unquote or is not being effective, efficacious against COVID. And again, please note what efficacy means. As I described, it is the you know it is the protection from the risk of disease not necessarily infection. Uh, so again, for in the COVID con context, we're talking about developing that, that, that disease uh, that, that the vaccine is preventing. So again, it's early days, we are learning as we speak, but as I said, from the available data, some of them are published, uh, you know, we can tell that, you know, there is a varying degree uh, of impact around the mutants. Uh, when it comes to being efficacious, uh, but they are still efficacious, you know, even if the extent uh, of efficacy, the efficacy rate uh, might be lower uh, with some of the mutants. And that's, that's not unique to COVID. You know, we have seen this with other vaccines as well. You know, typically, you know, the, the viruses, the RNA uh, viruses, typically, you know, they would mutate uh, pretty frequently, and sometimes the mutations would be of interest, of significance, sometimes of no significance, uh, but typically a vaccine molecule is expected to work against a broad range of variants, but not necessarily all, and that's why we need to monitor very well. We need to still continuously sequence uh, and understand what's the pattern of the variants um, so, uh, yeah, that's what we know so far. Yeah, uh, both Tiktiker and Kamarshi, thank you uh, for your explanations. Vaishak R is asking this question, will we have second generation of COVID-19 vaccines coming up? And how will their clinical trials be impacted, especially in terms of the availability of subjects? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, you, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell. And, and also, again, to, uh, to admit that I'm, I'm not a COVID expert, uh, so to say, by my space is global health, but I understand you know, the interest in here. Uh, so far, uh, you know, it looks promising in terms of uh, vaccines coming up for younger age groups, multiple 
uh, clinical trials are, are going on globally. Uh, and we expect, you know, sequentially these different age groups will uh, have clinical, cl clinical trial data. And if the clinical trial data uh, is assessed to be supportive uh, by the pre-qualification teams, then you know, uh, it would be in use. You raise a very important point that while you're having uh, the ongoing pandemic, you know, how do you recruit uh, subjects? And that's a, that's a real uh, you know, field challenge. Uh, you know, uh, to have a population which is not yet exposed, uh, but you still want to evaluate efficacy uh, in that population. And that's why we have, you know, our other kind of heroes in the world, the, the clinical trial experts, the medical doctors, and, uh, uh, and the clinicians, essentially, uh, who are doing that job. So yes, difficult, uh, but not completely impossible and multiple clinical studies are already going on in different age groups. Uh, Sriponna Chattopadhyay also uh, thanking you and uh, she doesn't forget uh, the due gift, actually. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Trouble. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Shandip Pal, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, can you want to say something? You, you yes. Yeah. So can you hear me, Anand? Yes. It's an uh, it's excellent talk. I mean, uh, I didn't understand any previously about the vaccine development and the other things, but it's now kind of clear to me. So I have uh, a question which is uh, typically not related with the vaccine development, but obviously related with the public health. So nowadays uh, we know that there are anti-vaxxers and there are countries which cannot afford the vaccines. So uh, for the public health, how to tackle this kind of uh, adversities in uh, vaccine, vaccination program? So, I mean, uh, do the development also have to think about all these things? I mean, about how to uh, go on against all these odds and uh, uh, do the right thing. That's a great point, Shondip Dan, and thanks for, for asking that. Um, you know, absolutely, yes. You know, and that's why I keep bringing up the issue of, of real world connect uh, of all the modern technologies and, and the work that we do. So this whole issue of public health communication uh, is critically important and should be incorporated uh, in the overall clinical development process of the vaccine. And, and in some cases, particularly in recent times, that has been done. Uh, so, you know, the vaccine rollout has been uh, in sync uh, with the communication strategies uh, that has been developed beforehand. But at the same time, as you point out, it's a tough, tough world these days. And the kind of uh, misinformation, rumors, uh, that that spread, you know, the, the, that spread is <laughs> is way higher, and in you know, in a much uh, you know higher speed than a virus spread actually. And uh, there is no one solution to that. I think raising awareness uh, from a very grassroots level, uh, you know, in science, and then you know, vaccine is only a part of the overall scientific tools. I think that is critically important. And then as public health professionals, we all uh, you know, have our roles to play to ensure we are not necessarily only communicating uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the pure scientific language, but we are contextualizing the messaging. Uh, we're ensuring we are, we are connecting with that, that one mother in, in, in a village who are, who's gonna decide about his child getting or not getting the vaccine to that one, you know, maybe professional uh, in, in that multi-storied building in a city uh, who's reading up internet and Googling about, uh, you know, uh, vaccines and all this stuff, you know, the, the messaging should connect, uh, you, know, you know, throughout this spectrum. And I think we need to do more work around that. And it's again, uh, a bit of a more challenging world than probably what it was uh, let's say during the time of smallpox eradication. Uh, so we have to, you know, get our act together and be smarter, I would say, 
uh, in the communication. But, but to, to confirm, communication strategies typically are part uh, of the overall vaccine development process. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Anandu. It, it's, it's a delight to have you here with us, and we really hope to have you. Uh, I mean, definitely you are extremely busy, but uh, we would love to steal some of your time also in future. And uh, thank you, and it's probably uh, almost uh, close to 10.45 at night, if you your time. So very good night to you. and. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks again. Thank you so much for, for the listening and, and the discussion. Take care. Take care. Bye. So we end this session uh, here. So stay tuned for more uh, 